I come from one of the oldest families in Ireland, still associated with one place. We were Normans. We came to Ireland. We built a castle. We cut down all the trees, and we made farmland, and we did very, very well. There have been some celebrities in my family. We had a poet, writers, artists, soldiers, politicians, even a saint. So that's a legacy. And my father would teach me my role, my future role. And my role was not to be an owner. No, you're a caretaker, a steward of history. Your job is to look after the past. Try and do something yourself. And most importantly, add something to pass it on to the next generation. Do you know what I said to that? Hell no, nah, brah. I'm going to go and listen to heavy metal. I'm going to date a girl with face tattoos. I'm going to live in Vegas. <laughs> and my dad, he'd laugh. He'd say, well, you might not think like that the rest of your life. Well, that was the thing with my dad. We, we had a great relationship. We tell stories, always telling stories. Irish people are very well known for telling stories. The stories I remember the most were the ones about the animals and all the young stories of my dad running through the woods seeing all these animals. And then I'd go outside and there'd be no animals. Occasionally, the odd cow. They get boring, by the way. So one day I asked my father, where are all the animals? And then he paused and he said, well, they're not there anymore. They are victims of our success in farming. My father died in 2011, and guess what? I never went to Vegas. I was the steward now. And every generation has a battle, has a fight. Nobody gets a free ride. Not rich or poor, we all have a battle. And I really realized that our battle was going to be the climate. In fact, we could be the last, could be the end, because our battle was life and death. It was the decision whether we were going to see the end of the natural world. And my father used to tell me before he died, if you're not happy about something, do something about it. So you know what? I said, hold my smoothie. And I said, fine, I'm going to do something about it. Because the problem is, we know what the problem is. Today, 60% of living species, mammals, are farm animals. 36% are humans. Anybody know what wild animals are? 4%. Animal agriculture is the biggest destroyer of forest and forestation, deforestation. Animal agriculture is one of the main culprits in the destruction of biodiversity. Animal agriculture is one of the biggest polluters and methane emitters. We have become victims of our success. And we're eating away our future, one hamburger at a time. Now, I'm sure there's lots of parents here and future parents. What are you going to say to your kids? You want to do the best for your kids? But you're going to eat your way out of their future. So I said to myself, no, I was not going to do that. If I have to fight, I'll, I'll die fighting. So I decided I was going to do something different. I was going to start a nature reserve because nature needed a break. The problem with the world today is we give nothing back. You ever try and be in a relationship where it's just take, take, take? First step to divorce. So I decided I was going to be an environmentalist. And at first I called it nature conservation. But nature conservation is a lot like British people walking around Spain with sandals and socks. It's, it's weird. <laughs> Everybody goes, well, what the hell, bro? So I was like, no, I'm not really doing that. And then I heard another word, and it was called rewilding. And I was like, mm, yeah, rewild. You can put that on a T-shirt. So I was a rewilder now. And I was like, yay, rewilding. But what is rewilding, you might say? And I would tell you, in my eyes, it is the natural restoration of nature's processes through organic actions or to the layman, we leave it alone, let nature do the business, and it's fixed. But that's 
as time went on, not quite what I was doing, because I realized that there was something different between what I was doing and what other people were doing. You see, a lot of rewilding is actually nonsense. It is regenerative grazing. So that's an excuse for you to have hamburgers. You don't really have to change your habits. And we are still eating our way to destruction. Now, don't get me wrong. It's better than the status quo. You're choosing the low-fat option. <laughs> Fantastic. But not enough. It's a side step, a half step. And guess what? We don't need half steps. We need big steps. There's a freight train coming. And we better get out of the way. So, no, I was doing something else. I was doing vegan rewilding, or as I like to coin the term, V-wilding. It's very clever, I know. So what is it that I was doing? First off, I was not teaching foxes yoga, and I was not feeding tofu to squirrels. I was not killing. My job was to allow nature to have a breath. It needed a breath. It needed space. So what I would do is I would leave everything alone. Nature knew what it needed. It was going to happen. So the farmer said to me, well, what are you going to do with all the land? And I said, oh, we're going to leave it. Nature. And he said, well, you're going to ruin the land. It's all going to be full of weeds. And I said, you don't know that for sure. He said, well, actually, we do. Um, he was right. Um, it exploded with weeds. And by the way, in Ireland, where I live, if you have too many noxious weeds in a field, the government will fine you. So I said, right, I'm not willing to use chemicals. So what am I going to do? I had to get gloves, workman's gloves. Unfortunately, the Plunkers didn't do a lot of manual labor, so I was without gloves. So I went into my kitchen, because we do wash our own plates. So I got pink gloves, right? Now, I want you to picture this. A six-foot-tall goth guy, death metal t-shirt, pulling weeds in a 200-acre field. <laughs> I looked. Ridiculous. <laughs> the neighbors thought I looked ridiculous, but I didn't care. So I did this for a month. I had great biceps, by the way. Girls would have loved it, except no girls. Um, and then the problem was, is as I pulled, they'd come back worse. So the first year, I did it for a month and gave up. And I said, you know what? I'll wait till the council comes back. Sends me a nasty letter. So the first year, disaster. Second year, worse. Third year, they were on steroids. Fourth year, mm, a little bit better. Fifth year, they were gone. And instead, there was grass, but not the same grass. We went from three grasses to 30 grasses. There were mosses. There were wild flowers. The place was exploding with life. And then there were insects. Insects galore, all the way through the field. And with the insects came the rare birds, and then the normal birds, and then the birds of prey. And with those birds, they have, were bringing new life into the place. I got to see one new animal return a year. I got to see pine marten. I got to see hares. I got to see the woodpecker. Now, the woodpecker hadn't been in Dunsany or in the county for 100 years, and I had them. So I was like, the wilding works. <laughs> and I said to myself, wow. But I did have a problem. And the problem was deer. Now, the problem is with Ireland is red deer destroy everything. They are like locusts. And we used to be able to control them with wolves. Problem is, we got rid of them, and now we had to do it. But I was vegan. I'm not going to kill anything. So I went from 40. Then I had 50. And now I had 150. And I risked going backwards, tumbling backwards. What if I was to tell you that didn't happen? What if I was to tell you that the natural regeneration of the forest was now doubled? What if I was to tell you the place was more alive than ever? Well, first, you might not believe me, but trust me, it did. But I noticed something. Every time I planted a tree, those grubby deer would eat them. And yet there would be trees everywhere. I couldn't go through the forest. I'd be like trying to not step on trees. So I did a little experiment. I took a bunch of seeded oaklings. And I got nine of them, and I planted three in one forest, three in another forest, and three in a third forest. And I planted them in between naturally seeded oaks. And I went for a, a cappuccino, and I walked away for 30 days. And I came back, and you know what happened? All nine of my uh, seeds, my, my trees, were eaten. And the naturally seeded oaks, untouched. How is this possible, you might ask? Have you guys heard of the mycelium network? 
if you haven't, it is a network of fungus underneath the soil. It's how plants communicate, and there's more and more evidence every day that they do communicate. Forests are communities. They communicate. They will protect themselves by letting off smells and tastes that will ward off grazing predators. Now, the mycelium network, when things are healthy, work and function. In fact, the more advanced the network, the better resistance it has. When we got rid of the animals, the farm animals, there was no more GMO. There was no more antibiotics. There was no more deworming medicine. So the land began to clean itself, detoxify, if you like. And the initial weeds that I was fighting were the succession process, the first stages of detoxification. And they were mending the damage. And things got a bit weirder. Not that it wasn't weird already. <laughs> One day I was walking down the woods, and I was trotting along. And then I heard someone cutting down a tree, and I said, how dare they? cut down my tree. So I got myself aggressive, got my chest pulled out like Conor McGregor, and I got my pointiest finger, this one, and I went like this, and I got my inner Karen mojo and said, hey you, you can't cut down my tree. And there was nobody there. And I thought, oh God, I've gone mad. I've been rewilded. <laughs> and then I saw it, something I am never going to forget. Two stags, big ones, they were hammering down a cherry laurel tree. And I'm not talking the David Atterborough, I'm scratching my neck horns. No, I'm talking about the more cartoon style, da, 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 smashing the tree. And I stood there like, and then they noticed me. And then there was what we call in the film industry, a Mexican standoff, where I was <laughs> going to reach down to my pocket very slowly. Don't spook him. I was reaching for my phone. And I got my phone, and I pulled it out. And... Fingerprint identification, mm. no, denied. Second time, Ooh, no. Third time, mm. no, oh, finger, oh, oh, cold now. And they ran. And I said, oh, that was weird. Nobody's gonna believe me. I... So I said, okay, we'll walk on. Over time, I began to notice that cherry laurel trees were disappearing. Now, first, I saw the branches gone. Then I, they looked diseased, and I was like, what's going on here? And by the way, cherry laurel is an invasive species. It, it grows very well. And I began to realize that cherry laurel was even being taken out into the fields. And I was like, well, what, who brought that there? Nothing eats cherry laurel. It absorbs arsenic from the ground. In fact, if you cut it, it will release cyanide. It is the nastiest, most evil tree. And in fact, there's even new research to suggest that if you attack this tree, it can poison the ground and kill all the plants below it for years. Nothing eats it. It is the terminator of plants. What if I was to told you that we discovered that the deer were eating it? They were destroying it. They were attacking it aggressively. And this invasive plant that I would not control was now in decline. What would that mean? Well, what if we restored things naturally? What if nature no longer had to fight against the pollutants and they started turning their attention on defending the forest? What if I could do that? What would that prove? That would prove nature adapting. This is speculative now, but understand, this is the only place so far that we have found that this is happening. We've spoken to scientists, we've spoken to educators, no examples of this anywhere else. I even Googled it. No. <laughs> and what if this is the first signs of change? What if this is the first signs of evolution? What does that mean to us in the natural world? It means that just because we've lost things doesn't mean we're whipped. We can still change, we can still have a future but it needs nature to be having a break. It needs nature to revive itself. How does one build muscle? One goes to the gym, you hit the bench, you damage the muscle, then you rest, and then it grows and adapts. We ourselves as humans are echoes of nature. We do the same stuff. We are merely echoes. So why isn't nature doing the same thing? Well, it does, and maybe this proves it. So what is the future? Of rewilding. Well, the UN says we have to rewild an area the size of China, so we better get busy, shouldn't we? And you might say, well, that's very nice for you. You're rich. You've got a big estate. Well, yes, that's true. <laughs> but, 
but that doesn't get you off the hook. Because the truth of the matter is, all of us got us here. All of us are responsible. Everybody wants a future. And that's the problem. It's always the, oh, it should be somebody else. We all are masters of our own destiny. We all create our world. And if you want a good world, if you want a future world, what does that world become? You make your own reality. That's one thing I did learn in my life. And I'll tell you something. It all comes down to what you decide to have on your plate, what you decide to make as decisions. So how do we do it? Everybody's got a windowsill. You can leave the grass alone. You don't have to kill things. And you know what? Our future can be great. It can be a utopia. We can be giants instead of monsters. The beautiful thing about nature is we're part of it. By trying to kill it, you're killing yourself. You're killing the future. And the wonderful thing about nature is all it needs is space and a breath. We, people used to laugh when you said, talked about going to space. And you know what? We got to space because we wanted to. Do you want to change things? Do you want a future?